But hey, everybody, uh, again, I assume for most of you, unless somebody couldn't have been here last time, which, you know, that's life. That's OK. No judgment here. Uh, I'm Chris Delion. In case somehow anybody missed it last time or something, I make video games on the Internet. Mostly I teach people how to do that. I've got video courses and ebooks and audiobooks and things. Uh, one of the things we're going to talk about probably later, my, I have a big old pile of notes here. Last time I talked with this class, it was about project management and scheduling and production stuff, which that video is also off my channel from a little while ago. But for that, I have a more, I have a lot more practice, A, talking to people about that. Uh, and I literally just finished and launched a course on it a few months prior. So I had a much kind of clearer sense of what I was doing here. I don't give a lot of marketing talks. Uh, I have not launched a course on this, so this is going to be a little more free form and winging it. If there are questions, by all means, throw them in the chat and I'll be trying to read it up as we go. That said, this might be a little scattershot as I feel my way through it. There's lots of points I can bring up. And one thing I'm going to bring up later on in there is this bit of kind of selective persona, which can sound a little gross, uh, but it's basically just this thing of who we kind of brand ourselves as publicly. And so even though to the public, I mostly am a game programmer, teacher, dude, uh, and I'm sort of a little unhinged on Twitter or whatever. Like a lot of what I do as a business person, I have earned my living as a teacher independently for eight years. That doesn't happen from like just teaching or just writing a game design book or something. That's a whole bunch of other work. So we'll be talking about what all this stuff looks like, because as we'll talk about, uh, writers got to do it. Comics people got to do it. Artists have to do it. And sometimes it's tough because people go to skill, go to school for a certain skill and then be like, OK, I want to go make a living with that skill. And they can't navigate I can't find those people. It's all this other side of stuff that, anyway, let's get right to it. Um, so one of the first thing I want to talk about, right, is this thing of, and lots of marketers will say this, somehow it bounces off people who are new to it, but everyone is in your audience. Uh, there's a feeling that if I can just reach enough people, if I can, you know, everyone, who is this for? It's for everybody. There's something in it for everyone. Old people, young people, people from different communities and cultures and backgrounds. That's just not the reality of anything. Like, uh, not everyone wants a Jeep or not everyone wants a big house. Not everyone wants, a, like, the Beatles, like there are people who dislike the Beatles or the movie Titanic. Like no matter what you pick, lots of people, it's just not for them. And that's OK. And this is partly important because. A, when you're posting about stuff and you have your social accumulator or whatever, if you're doing TikToks or YouTube or Twitter, wherever you live online and wherever your people may be important, live online or discord or something, there will be parts you're going to try to feel like you're holding back because, oh, shoot, I'm going to annoy or bother people if I post about my Patreon my new launch, I'm selling something. Does that feel gross? I'm asking people to join an email list, uh, I, I, you know, with merch or whatever. And the reality is, if that bothers them, you want them to unfollow you, right? Like the function of marketing is just as much to draw people to the flag you planted as to kind of ward some people off and be like, hey, I'm not saying you're bad, but you're in the wrong place. Go find where you're happy because this is what we're doing over here. And the sooner you can kind of shake those fleas out of your hair, uh, the more you can just full blast share with people who are happy to see you're succeeding and thriving and doing stuff. And you'll just have a much happier experience than always kind of pulling your punches. I'm like, oh, I, I want as big of an email list as possible. You don't. You want a dense email list of people who actually like respond to things and are looking forward to those emails and don't flag you as spam and don't get argumentative, et cetera. So part of it is that kind of filtering that happens when we can we recognize not everyone's my audience. Now, sometimes we don't know who our audience is. So you're almost going to be repeating a number of things here of, uh, as much as someone's like in a movie, someone be a scientist and they'll like invent something or they'll like be a scientist, like no chemistry. And it's like not really like science is experimentation, right? And likewise for marketing, there's a lot of things you can do that feel like marketing because I'm running ads or I'm doing videos. But if you're not actually experimenting and testing with any kind of relative, I tried a few different things. If you're just picking, here's my audience, I'm going to make stuff for that audience. You're not really marketing any more than that scientist who just like builds a robot in the lab. And that's not really science. Uh, it, it means you're basically, you have theories, but you got to test those theories to validate them before you put all your weight on. Here's who I'm going after. Here's the message. I think that's going to connect to them. You try some stuff knowing full, well, you might surprise yourself about, uh, one of my favorite examples are some business guy who writes a bunch of great books. Mike Mal, Mike McCallowitz. He often just goes by Mike M profit first. One of his main books he does for small business stuff, et cetera. But he was sort of surprised how much of his audience became married women working from home. That was that's not his background, his group, his personal identity. That wasn't what he thought he was doing. But that's who showed up for his book in droves. And he was like, I've come to understand things about my audience and the messaging that resonates with them and things. And, and it's just little stuff that it helps to understand. But he let himself be surprised and was able to kind of follow that lead in building his online personal business and brand and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's also recognized that this marketing stuff. It's a very big part of the work. 
I've known writers who they'll say 80% of their hours of work go into the marketing stuff, not writing things. It doesn't mean it's harder work in the sense of, you know, it's very different from the talent of the craft that goes into creating the content. But it is that the if you're doing it sustainably, if you're doing it as your work, if you're doing it as your career or something, it's you got to get in front of people. And that is a lot of essentially monotonous stuff. It might be kind of a slog. It might be kind of repetitive. It might be something that in principle, anybody could do, but someone has to do it. And unless you're paying someone else to care about it the way you care about your own livelihood, they're not going to. And so it just becomes, I'm going to have to try to connect to people. I'll reach out to people. Might Can I be on their podcast, their YouTube? I'll get lots of no's, but that's okay. I got to keep trying because I only have to find a few good leads to really kind of help build some momentum. And once I've been on some shows or made some presence, it's easier for me to get on others. But it's recognizing that that is just, like I say, it could be a slog a lot of time. A lot of game studios that I know, uh, some bigger, some movie projects, et cetera, their marketing resources, which granted hours, money, however you look at it, is basically in balance with what goes into the project itself, right? If they spend like 250 grand on a game, they might also spend 200 grand on the marketing. Uh, And even if you're not at that kind of budgetary scale, again, just resource wise, it's a sense of, maybe even worse in your time balance favor where your time's got to go if you're not particularly good or adept at it yet because you don't have much practice at it and fully expecting it's going to take lots of time. Yes, absolutely. It's very much. And this is right. Uh, someone just mentioned marketing requires as much skills and resources as it takes the, the thing you're trying to market. Absolutely. And it's also why at companies, there are entire people and departments and divisions of people who this is what they're doing. And like, if you ever see a skyscraper and it says AT&T on it, most of those people in that building aren't working on like, satellites or wiring they're doing marketing stuff and this is when i say like you have to do it and it's always part of the work that people also have this idea of like well i'm just if i just do a good job if it's good enough i won't have to and what can tell you that that's not true is that the biggest businesses in the world walmart and nike and apple and target and at&t or whatever like they are advertising constantly they're not so big they can just sit on the laurels and be like yeah you know what a model you know what a walmart is you're gonna buy nike you're we're, we're fine um, they know if they stop advertising Saturn cars, you're going to stop the they're in bad shape at every scale. You still have to kind of way to reinvest it. Um, yeah, absolutely. Even if your product is good and people won't know about it. And this is also it's part of a responsibility to recognize I have to put it in front of the people it's right for. And that's a part of the work experience. Who is it right? Who is it right for? And I think this this helps me feel less slimy about it. Not, you know, educator background, engineer background, creative background, all these things that we get a little primed against like business people who can feel like, are they manipulating people? Are they being tricky? Whatever. And I like, I got this quote from a friend of mine, uh, Tim Russwick. He's a game designer these days. He's an educator online in a different format that I teach a lot of big Udemy courses and stuff. Uh, we ran a game AI workshop earlier this year, but he's a online marketing background. And he helped me understand things when he said, Chris, if someone is glad you let them know about it, then it wasn't spam to them, right? You didn't bother them. They're happy. You did them a favor of they're like, oh my God, this is worth so much more to me than $10. Thank you for letting me know about your course. This this is, I, I'm really enjoying this comic. This, I feel like I'm listened to. I feel included. I feel represented here. This is, I'm so glad someone told me about this. And realizing that, you know, my dad used to literally go kind of door to door selling books or something. And some people would slam the door in the face. That's part of the work at scale. But as long as you still got some hits of people who are genuinely really happy, like we actually really have been wanting an encyclopedia Britannica to show up. This is obviously a while ago. Uh then it helps you realize, okay, well, this is part of the work. And those no's are part of finding the yeses who are, I'm making their lives better. I'm doing them a favor, even if I'm selling them something or connecting them to something that makes them happy. It's doing work that it's influencing people in the same way as when we started making comics, games, online courses, whatever. It's partly from, I want this to impact people for the better. And it's really, it's on us to figure out who, who will be glad they find out about it and how we can put it in front of them. And that's part of the work of marketing to figure out where are they going where do I find them? Uh, when I talk about testing and things, it's a deal about even figuring out the... Uh, uh, sorry, I'm distracted about Thai Influencer Studio. There, there, was this, there was a tweet about a whole Thai Influencer Studio of people who were just like in these little cubicles doing TikToks or vlogs or something. And you can't even tell. They might be on different platforms. Uh, but, you know, as compared to the old infomercial scene of somebody showing a sham wow or something on the television. But it's something where... You don't even have an easy answer to, well, the best platform to be on is TikTok or the best platform to be on is YouTube shorts. The best platform is Facebook because it depends on where are your people who are the right person for it. And if there are certain age strata, if there are certain 
field of study or career path in life, if they're a certain economic class, uh, they might be able to place together. The other weird maneuver is you may find some of the same people are connected to you on multiple platforms or follow you on multiple sites, but they're in a very different headspace browsing LinkedIn than when they're on Reddit, than when the same human being is scrolling on Twitter. And so it becomes a matter of I need to position and frame my message, my video, my text, my whatever in a way of, okay, well, you're you're kind of in water cooler mode over on this service. And over here, you've kind of got your tie on. This is a different way we're going to approach that they'll, be resp- they'll respond to. And one of the challenges we run into is they'll do something. Like, okay, well, I made a saw a discussion today. Guy posted his YouTube video on Facebook. He's like, hey, is Facebook penalizing when I post YouTube videos? And everyone I know who actually tracks conversions, tracks traffic going through, there's a few networks that might penalize because they're trying to sell you, post it natively, or they're trying to sell you, pay for an ad to promote it. But usually what's happening is people are on a site because they want to be on that site, right? They're in a mood for Twitter right now. And if you're like, hey, go look at YouTube, they're like, I didn't go to YouTube.com. I went to Twitter.com because I want to scroll a text feed. That's why I'm here. And so it's a very high friction ask to get someone to go off one platform to another. Um, And actually something I'm going to insert here because it's relevant to that point. On that note, again, people off of platforms. Another reason why it is helpful to scatter across multiple and if only to experiment, right? You still are probably going to have a main that's mainly where you find your people, whatever it might be. And again, I can't answer it. It depends on what kind of comic you're creating, what sort of audience you're reaching with it. But experimentation helps you figure out where are they. Also helps you keep all your eggs not in one basket. So like if, you know, for example, you built up an enormous following on Twitter for a bunch of years. And then more recently, you're like, wow, I have regrets. And my life is now recently worse. Um, That happens all the time. And in fact, it happens almost every network, almost systematically of early on, they make it easy to access people who chose to follow your business on Facebook or chose to do whatever to kind of follow and get your updates on whatever platform. And eventually they charge you for it because that's really their business model is to get between you and people who said, I want to hear about the updates from my favorite band. And so part of where you hear about people will kind of bang the drum about mailing lists and what makes mailing lists so valuable, they've got their other complications too, is a couple things. One being that a mailing list, more so than other services you own, in the sense of someone can't as much intercept between it and say, okay, well, suddenly the deal is if you want to talk to your 10K Twitter or your Facebook followers, your if you want to reach people who are subscribed to on YouTube, you have to pay us to do that. With an email list, you can blast at scale, obviously going through a proper email service, don't just, you know, BCC everybody, but you have a better chance of having a a reach where you're not having a gate in the middle. And that's where you can kind of build it up. And so part of people's goal becomes, okay, well, however many people I'm getting on YouTube, on TikTok, on Twitter, on Facebook, whatever, part of their goal becomes as many of those as I can possibly occasionally convert to, here's a reason to join my email list, because you'll get some behind the scenes looks, or because you'll get like the first PDF before everybody else sees the rest of the comic or some reason to get them onto your email list, that is then a safer harbor to kind of keep them in than, oh my God, what if this platform just pulls out the rug from under me tomorrow and I lose my thing or I get demonetized on the platform, or whatever, all these complications can happen, including just honest, sheer confusion combined with a lack of human support on their side to say, you know, you can't just talk to a human being and be like, hey, you got mixed up. I own the copyright to that. Put me back. You could just vanish for months, um, sometimes forever off of a platform. Uh, This also has to do, though, with the point about multiple points of contact. And this is an old marketing thing of most people, whether it's uh, an an ask, like read my comic, uh, it's an ask of their time, whether it's an ask for a sale, even a small sale, let alone a big sale, it's not going to happen the first time they've heard of you or the first time they've heard of it. They kind of need to, you need to be in the air a little while. They've they've seen your name before. They've seen some posts about it. They kind of recognize there's a style to it. They get kind of familiar And there's sort of this progression about, you know, the first time we don't see it at all. The second time we kind of notice in the corner of our eye. The third time we kind of like look at it because we've kind of started to recognize it. And before long, we might retweet a couple of them. We might reply under one with something kind of cute. We might screenshot it and post it somewhere else. We start to engage more with it. And there's a progression between they've heard of me not at all to buying a thing. And yeah, it's, it's, it's that repetition. It's multiple points of contact. But this is also where versions that can be, if you either appear to be or are everywhere of they can't escape you you're they're on this platform they go over here you're also on that platform they go over here they see your post on that platform that can help uh and it can also again find its way into indirect vectors and so an example of this and i don't love this author for his own just personal life things but 
Dilbert uh, as a comic was very successful in part because people who worked in offices, right, would put up these little not very funny, not particularly well drawn comics just because it resonated with them as people. And that was a kind of audience that if it was happening in 2023 would be on LinkedIn, not on TikTok, not on these other platforms. That's where those people would congregate. That's who it would speak to. And so it's figuring out, OK, well, how do I get it in front of those people? And it's not the obvious answer of, well, you know, Stinky Kate's killing it on Twitter. Well, this is a very different audience than Stinky Kate, who, by the way, is a awesome. Uh, I pretty sure it's, it's not Stinky Katie, right? Stinky Kate. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yes, yeah, something like that. Uh, it's just really cutesy, simple pictures of someone hug me before I die or feel sad. I know you've been struggling lately, so I drew you the silly bunny for you. Uh, Tummy Hurts Survivor, Stinky Book. And it's just super adorable, but also one reason why I really like Stinky Katie, and literally in my notes, the name comes up several times, is also because Stinky Katie, as far as I can tell, and A, I guess, disclaimer, you can never tell who's actually succeeding. Uh, it can be an illusion. I'll get to that in a second. But B, seems to be doing pretty well. And without being on camera, without being on voice, not podcasting, not on YouTube, not dancing on TikTok, as far as I know, and I think I checked before this because I wanted, didn't want to say this point without trying first at least, I don't think you can figure out if this person was on a bus across from you, you can't find a matching picture to be like, who is that human being? Um, which is nice because I know some people have more privacy concerns than others. And it means you don't necessarily have to be, shoot, I don't want to be on camera. I don't feel like I have stage energy. Face for radio, however you want to put it. Okay, well, there's ways to succeed at this still, potentially. And the reason I say the, 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 the note about that sometimes it's an illusion. One other course that goes on is that... Uh, you can think someone is killing it when what they're really doing is just paying for attention. Uh, and I don't think Stinky Katie's doing this at all. This is not an accusation there. This is just an observation that there's businesses where it seems like, gosh, their ads are everywhere. It doesn't mean their ads are successful. It doesn't mean their products are selling. It could mean that they're just burning through a wild amount of cash, really betting on this has got to pay off. And then they just kind of vanish. And it'd be like, I remember there was a, I think in the San Francisco mall, there was a store that only sold socks. And I was like, how are they paying San Francisco mall rent? And the answer was they weren't. Um, it disappeared forever before long. You can't assume that it's working just because it's an operation. Um, there's ways to kind of pay for fame. Uh, this also includes this. So when you see someone else, let's say part of this kind of business stuff too is modeling what someone else is doing in my field. What can I learn from their kind of model, their interactions? Let's say I see someone else has promoted their comic, whether it's they're running a paid ad or it's just like a tweet that's going viral or something. And there's a thing in there I can click on. My mistake might be, okay, well, they're selling a little $5 comic. So that's how it works. Gosh, I could do that. What you want to have to do, if you're trying to really understand what their model is, you get business expenses, et cetera. Assuming you're running this a proper, you know, above board business, but you need to kind of pay further in the funnel because something you'll figure out is that, okay, well, this is actually part of a program to get you on, to sell you on a whole series or to sell you in, in in my kind of field, someone wants to try to sell you on more training. Someone wants to try to sell you in a one-on-one -on -one live webinar. Someone wants to try to have a higher ticket item merch connected to it, a, a annual email list that has various other kind of promotions through it about their other books and stuff. But there may be a part of that machinery on the other side of it that you don't see until you've punched through. I've given you my $5, $10, whatever their entry. I've signed up for the email list. Let me just see what happens next, at least to figure out, okay, the actual way they're actually sustainably running these ads so that the return is higher than the cost per ad is that, let's say, X percent up front join the email list off the, off the click of the post, the viral thing. X percent of those proceed down. And if how many of those have to make a purchase at this price to justify the ad spend? But again, all that becomes invisible about what's happening beyond the line. If you don't find a way to start really sort of exploring that and study that as, I'm trying to get good at this. How is this happening today? All you see is the surface level. And if you copy the surface level, it, the numbers won't work. They can't. They rarely do. It's typically what a version of that seven points of contact kind of built in through an automated series or through leading you to their playlists on YouTube or something else. Their whole web series online, right? I mean, SMBC or XKCD, these things with years of comics. And obviously, they're running very different models than what I'm talking about. But if you can steer them towards, okay, how do I get more of a lifelong fan out of this? I need to show them I have an archive. I need to show them more stuff show them some highlights. How do I do that for them? Uh, it's a whole maneuver to it. And it can feel a little, again, sleazy or sketchy of like, oh man, am I just copying their business model? And that feels like kind of corrupt creatively. And the thing to realize here is that part of what you're doing is really respecting the conventions of the time. And this is one of the kind of quirky things that's different than if you're drawing your comic, if you're singing a song or something else, maybe a little bit, you still want to do some competitive analysis. But in this sort of case, part of what happens is there's just changing attitudes about 
what's an okay way that people feel comfortable about being approached or how they respond to a sales offer or what kind of sales website or whatever they are currently responding or engaging with. And being aware of those isn't being dishonest or unoriginal. It again is respecting that, okay, well in the year 2023 storefronts look a certain way. And if I just do it, how it makes sense in my head, it might look kind of like the way things looked in the nineties, which might be a bad vibe for a whole audience who happens to be the people I'm trying to reach. I need to figure out what are people responding to that are the kind of people I'm trying to look at and then figure out how do I adapt that to what I'm doing. Uh, let me scroll past. I got a whole chunk there I brought up. So again, kind of hop pile of notes here. Oh, so, so part of the marketing game too, and this is, you might even already know this just from seeing how Marvel does its movies and TV shows, etc. But it's very much this element of if we can make it a thing people talk about and are aware of, that already adds value to people who might want it in the same way that if I say I beat Elden Ring or Battletoads or Mist or something like this means something because it has people have heard of that. That's a thing. If I'm if I'm browsing the bookstore and I see Transmetropolitan graphic novel, I'm more likely to read that because my, my friend Darina talked about it. And that's the thing we'll be able to talk about. It has some cultural weight to it versus while it sounds interesting that if there's some nice comic no one's ever heard of, I might read that it doesn't have that cultural currency of access to a conversation. And this is, again, where obviously that are very different scale than we are at Marvel at all. It's just the most visible ones we can all kind of share as canon, where they're very much trying to make it, oh, there's part of a conversation happening right now. And if you want part of that conversation, a portal, some social currency, as much as how is that sports team or how is the weather, then you want to be aware of it. And that's a tough maneuver to pull off. Any shred of that at any scale you can do is part of what goes on. Where So, I mean, I... I uh, I think literally the only movie I've seen since COVID has been Barbie. Um, I sat in the back of the theater with my mask on. But part of what inspired me to go was the people who were very loud about hating it. Um, and I was like, this this is a movie for me. And just that it's a conversation, right? And so there's even things where the business might even be amplifying, retweeting the people who are mad about it, knowing this is it's a thing people are talking about. Come be part of the conversation. Uh, famously, the Elvis agent for the musician Elvis sold I love Elvis pins and also I hate Elvis pins because... The job is just to get people talking about Elvis and having their loud opinions. And so a lot of businesses are not beyond if it gets on the front page of Reddit or the logo and someone's like, I hate Coca-Cola. They're like, it'll make some people thirsty. Everyone over here upvote this today. Um, businesses are not above that. Uh, <laughs> we've got push people away. Um, yeah. And again, it's it, it can very much also be a case of, I don't know, I run an online community, for example. And so we have a very, I'm oh, sorry, the question here being, it seems to extend the idea of pushing away people who can be important and tangential way to attracting new audience members. And, and yes, yeah, so it's like our community, our, we have like a very open anti-harassment policy and some standards and things that makes clear like if you don't align with this kind of set of values, this may just not be the right community for you in a way that knowing that that helps some people recognize like, oh, I might feel safer here. This can be a place where people will be patient with me and we're kind of going to celebrate some more diversity and other things that not everyone online, that's the default assumption of someone's experience. Uh... Yes, it's, it's, this is why Fight Club had rules. Um, one of the very, very hardest things to do, and some might even say impossible, with every inch you can get better, the more you win, is trying to get out of your own head. And this is especially hard where it's just you as the creator of the thing. Your relationship to your content will always be different than anyone else's on Earth. You've looked at it more. You know the reason behind all of it. Uh, but it is part of why. And again, it can feel so mucky when you're new to it. And you're like, this seems insincere and worthless but like it's really what's going on with this, the focus groups the surveys the the data tracking and all that mess um let's say you have a digital comic and it's it's posted in a way you have analytics just the most basic clicker analytics per page so i can tell what page did people stop reading on did they stop reading on page seven did they stop reading on page three or something and at the very least uh, could i use that information to go investigate not to say i'm going to pivot just because everyone should finish reading my comic but can I use an information to say, are people people getting a wrong idea? Are they getting the wrong vibe? Or am I trying to say something here that the way people are actually receiving it is very different than what I thought I was saying? And it lets us be better in tune with, am I speaking in a way that what they're hearing is what I mean to be saying, as opposed to, oh, I'm turning them off because I wasn't aware there's some cultural conversation going on. And uh, that kind of thing is a version of that. It's really, it's listening to the audience. It's engaging with them as a conversation, not, not just I'm talking at you like some 1950s television program of someone who's broadcasting themselves, but it very much can be a sincere, I am eager to better understand who is interested in this, what do they like about it? And there's various other ways that can be behoove us as 
business people, uh, which again, I always feel a little apologetic about saying it that way, but it's a matter of making sure that uh, I understand who it's going towards because there's these things like, let's say if you are ever paying for ads and I don't know, let's say you make a comic about, I don't know, the uh, a samurai situation in history or something, uh, perhaps the most obvious words you could pay to add target for that are in high demand. Maybe there's some best-selling game right now that has also that kind of action going on. So those are in high demand. They've really dropped, dropped the cost per clicks of those. If you can there's something else that your readers have in common, a lot of them are, I don't even know why this would be the case, rock climbers who work at car dealerships or whatever. But if you can find it because you're talking to your customers, they message you, they're part of the community, you get to know some things about them, you converse with them in more informal context on Discord or something, and you realize like, that's a pattern, you may be able to find that there is a way to reach the people who will be happy to find out about it with indirect uh, ad buys that keep you out of the toe-to-toe with giants of who has real ad spend on the most direct targeting of their people. So like a bunch of my customers are cat people. Um, If it's an overlap with computing or programming or games or uh, internet lulls, who knows, but it's a fact. And so like that is of interest and of use to me in making things that relate to, what am I going to retweet? Things that might resonate with people who I serve. Uh, let me see if I've got. Uh, I'm gonna make sure I kind of hit some highlights. We're getting near. Lots of, so, so again, so lots of testing at every single theory. It's recognized every idea you have to not trust it beyond anything of like, well, I should test this. And so, there's versions of this where, okay, I've got I have to run ad copy on Facebook or even just posting tweets or subject lines for an email to try to get people to open it. And a lot of them they either have built-in A/B testing or some others you can kind of manually do a bit of process and experimentation, a bit of trial and error. But if I can try a few different things and figure out what are people actually responding to, and it might even be a small sample, might be a, you know, not big numbers, but if one gets twice as many, then I'm like, all right, well, I I should double down my energy and effort in that approach because it's going to be time and energy and money and hours and tweets better spent or whatever than just kind of going for like this one. I like the sound of that. Okay, well, that's fine. But you're not, you know, the people who are on the other side of this. Uh, so how do you, okay, so how do you navigate space between pandering to your audience and staying faithful to your clients? So even this is absolutely can always be a choice, right? And so this is a version of, uh, it's okay, let's say this. So you, you've done all this work. You've made an entire comic. It's a big comic with all this great art and writing and you've tested it and so on. And you're trying to figure out what you want to call this comic. And, and maybe you're not like super passionate about the title, right? You're not going to like tattoo it on yourself. And you need to, you need to have a title, you have to be able to find it somehow, but you're not, feeling super strong or even let's say it does matter to you but you have like three or four ideas that kind of all seem like you'd you could see any of them being okay if you can name test that title and figure out like people are not going to click on and want to read the one that's called this named after the main character or named after the moon that they're on or named after the situation that they're in or named after this point in history or whatever the hell but if i can name test and find that out of these four different ideas out of which i'm basically indifferent to that's not really what my heart was. I, you know, I didn't become a title author. I just wanted to make a comic. I had to put a title on it. Well, okay. Well, if that one's the clear winner by 20 X, then I'm going to give those people that title because I want to get the rest of my work in front of all those people rather than be really like, no, but again, if it's like, go oh, God, no. Cause like I, my, my mother's maiden name is part of the title. And like the other parts, like my dog, I lost. And this is all very important to me. Like, sure. You can make that choice in the world if you so choose. And you can make your balances elsewhere. There is always a choice. There's also the advantage of if it is you doing the marketing as opposed to trying to find some other marketing guru expert who, by the way, uh, well, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, basically, if it's you within yourself, you can navigate those compromises much more in fine balance uh, in a way you feel right about than being at odds or having a knife fight over, well, I'm not sure the business is going to exist in the year if you want to make that trade off. Well, but I think it's the whole reason we exist. And I was not only in business and it's part of why I work for myself and do all my own marketing. But speaking of which, as soon as you start doing any kind of marketing or Googling any of this kind of stuff or, or posting some things that are even vaguely related to it, my goodness, you will be flooded. You will be absolutely hammered with ads nonstop about marketing formulas, marketing gurus, marketing agencies, marketing courses, because the thing to understand is marketers are marketers. And so they sure as hell are very good at that domain and at the very least trying to sell you on their stuff. Now, the stuff often is any better what you can find on YouTube. So like, don't buy it unless you're just curious to look at it. But like, they're mostly good salespeople. And so some of the time I'll engage with that, not to buy their stuff, but to look at how they're selling because they're pretty impressive at when they're in their peak form. You're like, wow, this I would have bought this if I didn't know better. Um, yeah, they're very good at it. Um, but just to realize like, yeah, it's usually... 
uh, not that helpful. A, they don't understand this stuff as well as you and your domain. B, in many cases, even if they have like a whole agency, those are really meant to accelerate. If you've already solved your solution and you know who your leads are, you know who your customers are, you have a list, et cetera, they can just absolutely floor it on that. If you haven't sorted that out, they're just going to floor it in whatever wrong direction you were doing stuff because you don't have that sorted out. Um, yeah, the timers and stuff, which it's, it, there's, it, they, some of the things they do it because it works. There's also these weird copywriting tricks, like they'll do uglier websites because people respond to that. There'll be these weird copy hacks of a typo is more likely to catch eye attention. Anyway, again, you can make your choices about where you want to draw the line or what kind of customers you want to attract to repel in your communities and audience and fans and so on. Uh, and one thing, actually, I, and this is also about this audience reach thing. Some two notes about that. One, I still think about there's a movie, Independence Day, the one with Will Smith longer ago. And, you know, it was this very big budget summer action flick when that was still kind of a, a pretty common pattern to see. And they very successfully, if you go look up the trailers for it, like one trailer positions it like a horror movie. One, one trailer positions it like an action film. One trailer positions it like it's a comedy. It's a mixture of all those things. It's a movie with a lot going on in it. It's not dishonest. It's framing that this might speak to this side or the other. But part of what that achieved was that in Waves, it basically established this might be your date movie. This might be a go out with your buddies movie. This might be a go watch it when you're alone to get cheered up movie. And it could be all of those. But they didn't have the ad say it's everything to everyone all the time. They were selective about this might speak to you when you're in this headspace. This might speak to you in that headspace. And it's a version of this kind of testing. Um, the other thing to keep in mind though, for this, especially in the reviews world, uh, which is a nice thing. but if you overdo that to a degree of maximize sales through trickery or giving someone the wrong impression what's behind curtain number three, your reviews will reflect bad. And so it is often in your interest to make sure it is like, okay, I want to get people who are not going to regret this. So we're not going to ask for a refund. We're not going to feel bait and switch. And that might sound obvious, but again, it's just a reminder of maximum numbers is not the goal. Dense numbers of people who are like, this is really what I wanted. Yeah, absolutely. The mobile game trailer stuff is the most chaotic version of that, as someone mentioned. Um, and, and the other thing to mind for this stuff is that really you're often playing with thresholds. And so when I have viral videos, I didn't bring in all that traffic. I brought in a little bit more traffic than other people those days or those weeks from my different incoming posts elsewhere or whatever I could. Because what those platforms are looking for is at any given time, they have kind of a big screen they can put up on a projector. And they're just trying to figure out where if we put it, are more people going to stick to our website, come back, want to share it, we're posting, whatever. And if you have a little bit of an edge over the other folks who are trying to post content or post the things, that's what can get the algorithm to just kind of jet to the top. As soon as you're kind of in the middle ground, you're less well off. And that's also why people start to really do that. All the extra legwork of if you were an indie musician touring, right, of going around in person. And comics people do this too, right? They'll go to conventions, they'll sign things, they'll sell copies in person, which does not scale as well as online. But that is also what builds those relationships. You might be kind of long term fans of yours who every time you release a thing, tell all their friends when they go back home to their communities. And so it's where people are serious about this kind of stuff, whether it's comics, music, indie games, etc. Those people have that much more advantage over the tipping points of when they post a thing, people who are ready to share it, looking forward to it. Um, and that looking forward to it, bit is also this part of marketing positioning stuff. It is not a thing where you can wait until a product is done and then figure out now I got to market it. Um, by that point, it is often for many people kind of dead in the water. And part of what's going on is that you want people, and this is where, again, building up fan base, email list, followers, whatever you can, to help them know when this is coming out. And this is part of why that scheduling stuff I talked about last time is so important to be able to say, like, this is coming out October 31st. It's going to be there for Halloween, which is scary if you don't feel like you have a good schedule, but you have to to do this for it to work. And whether you want to take pre-orders, whether you want to tell them it's going to go live on this website, on this URL that day, that's when you do it. That sort of thunderclap of activity is what drives those algorithm things to tip so that it's getting a bunch of trending on Twitter or getting lots of reshares or getting lots of comments on TikTok or whatever that to the algorithm just looks like, oh, shoot, we should jet fuel this one because people are really about this. And anything you can do to tip towards that again is where that comes from lead time. It's why movies will be like coming summer of 2026. And you're like, how? How do you know? That's so long from now. Uh, that's really what they're doing. They're trying to load up that that uh that thunderclap kind of thing uh leveraging oh so uh leveraging other audience stuff instead of vertically integrating would comic where be? <laughs> uh so leveraging other audience that refers to i for better or for worse have mostly there's a version something called vertical integration in business where instead of partnering with other agencies and things you try to kind of do it all every part of the supply line yourself or something so basically i've tried i have my own podcast i have my own youtube channel i have my own this that and the other 
there's pros and cons to that. I control them. I have a lot of say over them. I also, it's possible if you think of, okay, so I've got this apple tree of people who I can reach who are kind of my followings on my platforms. Some percentage of those may want my productivity course. Some percentage of those may want to join my training service or something. I can kind of like shake that tree so some apples fall out. And there'll be a point at which all the apples are going to fall out of that tree have fallen out of that tree. And at that point, the only answer is what could have been answered again, which is leverage other people's audience. And this is part of where it is, can I go on someone else's podcast? Can I collaborate with someone else on YouTube? Can I, and perhaps let's say again, maybe you're a comics person who perhaps don't want to be on camera, don't want to be a person on the internet valid, but you also see plenty of quiet comics people who will kind of like do an exchange of, hey, I'm going to draw a comic in your style today and vice versa, or we're going to have our characters have a little convergence or something. And part of what that confers to the, to both audiences is a level of trust of, okay, well, I was a fan of this person and they seem cool with you. So you must be pretty decent. And both parties can benefit from that. Obviously, if you're kind of at the same level, right, you're not going to get Bill Watterson's attention probably to like, let's do a trade with Calvin and Hobbes. But if it's someone else, perhaps, you know, from this class, perhaps, you know, from just other online communities, perhaps going to reach out to a hero and like, oh, someday I'd like to do a collaboration with you. I don't know how it happened, but that would be awesome. And then five years from now, like, oh, I have a website. What do you think? But those sort of things are really leveraging other people's audience. Uh, part of where my business growth comes from is I get on someone else's podcast, someone else's show, do a workshop with somebody else, suddenly a bunch of people from their audience who are apples. They might even be low hanging, might even be loose, might be ready to fall from that tree, have not already been shaken out from my email list, my YouTube channel my reach on a certain platform or something. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And so we have a, someone noting here, like they, they consider this class because they knew the instructor and this is very much a part of how it works. Um, there are, so, so speaking of which, the part of how my business and many other online businesses working can for comics people as well. And I think it's probably working for, for stinky Katie, if I had to guess. There's this thing and some business people call it reciprocity, which feels gross. Where it's like, okay, I'm going to give, give, give. I'm going to post good content, free content, share stuff make people happy, and then they're going to feel like they owe me one. That's not really what's usually going on. What's really going on is people are like, wow, I my day is brighter because this person is a part of the world around me, and I really enjoy what they're putting out good in the world. I, I'm glad they're out there doing good stuff. They seem like a good person. And as soon as that person puts a buy button on the internet, I may not even want to read the comic or wear their merch or like watch the video course, but I want to help support them because they just seem rad. And I, I'm more than happy to give them five bucks, 10 bucks, 10 bucks. Can I be part of their Patreon? great. I'm part of the mission because I just like fueling. I wish there was more of that kind of positivity, that energy, that inspiration. That seems like a good thing. And this is very much a, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a thing where it's part of the dynamic of giving content and things. It's part of it's the multiple points of contact, part of it's establishing authority. Part of it also is the sense of there are people who will just become fans and kind of everything you will, if you have a multi-series comic, they might buy all of them. If you have a Patreon, they might join it. Um, because they want to be supportive of, they appreciate that what you're out there, what they're doing. They may not even necessarily be that into reading it and that's okay. It's not inherently a bad thing. Uh, it's also an area where contests and competitions can become relevant. And this is where figuring out how to reach those audiences outside of our own trees. I've been an organizer now for a bunch of years with Indicade, um, anymore, mostly the alumni lead, but it's an arts festival where in 2010, I submitted my little poetry game about relationships or something. It's a really abstract thing. Uh, use the accelerometer to make a lock undo or something, but they selected as a finalist, which every year a bunch of press and journalists go to Indicate to figure out what they might want to cover and bring back to their crew at IGN or whatever. Say, hey, there's some cool indie stuff happening in LA or New York City or Paris. Check these out, and or that becomes a ticket to wave to kind of get credibility. Be like, hey, you should let me on your panel. I have an uh, uh, Indicate finalist and. Whatever version that might be in comics, in art, in your different scenes, in writing groups, in other kind of creative scenes, it's a place where if you can get some of that recognition, they can help get those leads to the new audiences you might not reach otherwise by becoming visible to some journalist, someone else who is an influencer, someone else making their content, but also realizing that the awards themselves are not the answer. I've got a lot of peers who actually have like a full trophy case and still have yet to figure out how to make a business of it five or 10 years later. Um, it becomes, I have to find some way to transform this ticket I got into feeding myself or paying my rent is a non-trivial maneuver. I've got a question here. Any thoughts on keep your audience with you as you branch in new areas? For example, home team, long they make productivity course. So that's a good question. So that's a case where it was actually the opposite there. Home team, they needed project management because they're planning these long-term projects. So it was really being built based on, I've worked with a lot of them on this process specifically. And instead what I did was I generalized it out from that. I said, okay, well, this worked for games, but most of it wasn't games specific. 
This is the complete every project.com course. So instead, if I can just kind of extrapolate a little bit, and again, I'd applied similar techniques to my audiobook creation, my video courses, my small business stuff that wasn't game. So I, I had evidence it wasn't just game specific. Then that was something where I can make it useful to more people. And I like that. The other kind of thing that's going on here, and this is sort of a systematic scale. This is a different talk than marketing. It's another kind of bit, part of business automation. So for 180 games released from home team game dev, I have walked every single one of those people through building their schedules. Like that's just been our ritual of you're in this group. I train you through that. And now increasingly people can watch that video if they prefer that mostly to the schedule on their own and have a shorter call and be like, Hey, this looks right. And I'm like, looks good to me, but it takes me out as a pipeline of a bottleneck, which is both better for scale, better for my time. Some people who are shy would rather do that than have an like sit down together, looking at schedule together. It feels like a little, you know, backseat driver is also sort of like the school principal or something a little intimidating to some people. And the other nice thing about it is it just, again, it can work for more people than it possibly could if it's bottlenecked on me as one person. So it's also part of what's going on there of, okay, well, if I keep having the same conversation with people, it's where FAQ pages, it's where a video you want to cast to an interview or something. I keep answering fans' questions. Let's put an interview out there where we get some of these answers embodied. So when people have questions, I can point them to it and be like, oh, it's answered well over here. A version of that's kind of what's going on too. But I was only bringing the home team people to the productivity. The productivity stuff is getting generalized out from, here's a test bed we tested it in. Now we can get this to serve other people in broader spans. This was also honestly just like to be blunt and obviously home teams, many people, always many people, I love these people, but it is certainly a foot in balancing my portfolio of risk of, I have some non game dev stuff too. If for whatever reason, the game dev scene, technicalities, business licenses, whatever, it's just, it doesn't hurt to have a little diversified portfolio of, I have other things where I've got a little bit of a head start. Uh, I would try some opportunities to, I get on some podcasts, talk about productivity while I'm there. Someone finds out about a home team. Uh, or I talk to a class about comics creation and they're like, oh, home team exists. Maybe I happen to also make video games. Um, and they very much those sort of things happen. Uh, I've got, I don't think I want to talk too much about paid ads. No, you know what? I will say a couple things about ads here just because again, I know it's. So when an ad works, right, a couple of things are happening. One, you're either trying to find a way to get it in front of those influencer people, the journalist people, whatever, uh, especially if you're selling a not expensive product, you're not going to have a high average value cost transaction for those. But. Two new things to know about that. One is this thing called lookalike audiences. It's one of the reasons people accumulate an email list. It's one of the reasons that people accumulate a Facebook following for their brand, their page, their comic, their whatever. And what that has to do with is basically it's a way that Facebook and part of their ad machinery is they basically have a fingerprint of the people who use their sites and every website that has a pixel on it from Facebook doing tracking, et cetera, which again, could feel gross. I'll get to that in a second. But what it does is you can say, hey, here's a list of people who've been my readers who are happy with it or customers or whatever. Can you find me more people like that? And Facebook will just kind of like shake its black box of weird data it tracks about all of us and be like, yes, here they are. And it's suspiciously good at it because they're people who listen to the same music or from the same regions or in the same general age or economic class or whatever the hell it was that it could cross section identify in that fingerprint of lookalike data you gave it from either properly privacy policy email list collection with GDPR, yada, yada. That's a whole other art to do that stuff, right? Or Facebook page makes us much more easy native to say, hey, I want to add to connect people who like already liked my comics. This is also one of those downsides of if you're trying to pump up your comics page and, you know, social proof is a thing of I want some slightly bigger numbers at first. If it's really just a bunch of your friends and family who aren't actually your fans, you might actually be sort of polluting your lookalike audience of it's thinking like, oh, you want people like your dad and like my dad's never going to want this. That's not who this is really for. And again, we're back to we want density, not bigger numbers. Oh, it's the thing about hyper-targeting. Really, it's better for small businesses. Um, it's a thing where every... I, I'm very data private too, but gosh, uh, it's what enables us to exist when we have a very niche need that we can fill with a very niche way and we can't afford TV ads or billboards or whatever because businesses doing that are still going to be fine when we lose our data tracking, but that's sort of the argument for hyper-tracking stuff. Uh, there was at least one other point I want to bring up here. People are... Oh yeah, the persona thing. And again, this is, it's... It's a mess of everyone's a complex, real deep person. But that said, especially if they're not your friends, your family, your coworker, we kind of have to simplify people in our mind to be one thing. And so it becomes a case of like, there may be nuances about how you feel about, uh, I, there was some actor who said some stuff about he was skeptical of the pharmaceutical industry, which like valid, but unfortunately the timing overlapped with, and also there was a bunch of pushback about vaccine resistance and so on. And he got sort of like incorrectly put in a bucket of people who he's not on the side of in a way that hurt his connection to his audience because it's hard to have nuance at that scale. And so it becomes a choice about where we want to draw those lines of like, there are things where 
gosh, if we could get the copyrighted data out of it, and if it's not being used to generate and sell stuff, but it's being used to do certain adjustments, certain circumstances, there's some core use of technology from that AI stuff. But I certainly don't want to sound like I'm either anti-writer strike or like I'm for generated art or for selling crap on Amazon AI generated. So I'm like, there's nuance that cannot be had productively. So I can have a conversation with people who are like, I know this person, there's some way it might impact our future in some weird ways, but it is being cautious about, okay, the thing I'm centrally identifying is, is this approach, this is the energy I bring. And I think about, you know, these heroes, our Bob Ross, our, uh, our, our Mr. Rogers, um, these people who like, Bob Ross was a military sergeant. He yelled a lot at points of his life. He has it in him. Uh, Mr. Rogers, I'm sure is a more complex person who at times is frustrated with weird customer service s- situations, but he was selective about here's who I am in the same way as hip hop artists in the same way as Stinky Katie are presenting just a certain lens into like, it's not dishonest. It's saying, here's a simplified part of me that the public can handle that I am being a little conscious is about. I'm vegan. I don't need to make that my whole deal though. If I'm trying to just talk to game developers. Um, yeah, he's a military guy. Anyway, so I guess that's the end of my time. Uh, let's see if there's any other one last point I can sneak in. Basically not assuming anything's right or best till you track it, test it, um, instrument stuff. I guess the one idea I'll stick on that is the idea of a funnel. And that's where when you track these steps between who clicked on a tweet, who got to a page from there, who signed up on the thing, who stayed to email five, who made a purchase, et cetera. Um, those, they call it a funnel because it depends on percent fall offs. And if you don't track an instrument that you can waste all your time on your sales copy headline, your page colors, your logo, not realize no one's even getting to that page because they're not clicking on the ad or maybe they're clicking on the ad, but they're all bouncing off that page. And then your energy better spent there instead of fiddling more with the ad. That's what that tracking instrumenting is about, but that's probably time for me. Um, Thanks for letting me come back. What should it be? And again, so I'm going to bring it back to the most important thing to me from the market side is really experimentation. And so rather than say like have one good video trailer about their thing or one good crafted post, I would say that I'd be better have three to five less well-made, less perfected, less polished, different angles at it, right? This Independence Day, is it a horror movie? Is it a comedy? Is it whatever? that are, again, authentic to the piece, authentic to you, but that you can try posting to see, like, which one gets the most retweets? Which one gets the most likes? Which one gets the most people coming to talk to me about it afterwards to realize, like, gosh, I, I, you know, there's a bit of a sad story in here, and that could be that angle, and that could speak to somebody. I didn't realize I was jiving with people. Um, that, or again, like, name testing or something. Uh, but basically, experiment um, is, I think, the, the lesson for the day, uh, and that if you can do some experimentation, it's going to behoove you massively so you don't spend a ton of energy on it turned out to be the wrong thing. And if I can, um, yeah, I'll sneak in this one last little thing again. It seems gross. Um, there's companies in there who they will advertise games that don't exist yet and literally drive the traffic to competitors who have like, uh, here's a pirate game. I don't care or whatever. Um, to figure out what game's worth building, to find the intersection of, well, I may as well know what I could sell before I put their work into making it. And again, we're back to this title question. If there's like three books I just as well make and I also have to be able to sell it, I might as well vaguely get some feel for like people respond better right now to the one about the volcano for whatever reason. So I'm going to write that one first. We can test this kind of data to figure out listening to our audience. What do they want from me right now? Yeah, you have to have some way to analyze the failure. You know, it's just those metrics of views or shares or engagement somehow. Sure thing, y'all. Yeah, I'm happy to stick around. But again, like like uh, the instructor mentioned, if you'd rather me not stick around, that is totally valid. Uh, just direct message the instructor and I will pop out. Hey, what's up? So one quick bonus I want to throw in here because I forgot to mention the class. I'll probably even email the instructor after and point to if they want to share this video to capture this point. Again, I just didn't fit it in to when I ran out of time. But it's, this, I think, important point when you're starting out that it's because it's a one time chance you can catch this wave. And I encourage you to do it. What I'm referring to here is that so many people, they have this anxiety about thinking that they need to be great before they start doing things in public. Right. They need to get their final draft. They need to be able to prepare their magnum opus. They're super impressive. Their best work they can possibly do. And a couple of problems with that one is that if you do it, then I think I mentioned in there, right, it's that it's going to be dead in the water because it's catching people off guard. They're not looking forward to it. They they can't be ready and waiting for the date you've been saying or this project they've been looking forward to for a while. Even if it drags out a little, they can't know about it if you're hiding it from them until you feel like it's fully polished and finished and ready to go. And the other reason why this is so important that they would like to be coming up with you to following your progress, to you sharing as you're making choices about what to do and how to proceed and the struggles you're going through, a couple things are happening. One, they'll get to know you better, right? Much stronger sense of community. And you just have to say this one time this wave can get captured. Once you're on the other side of this wave, you, you've, you've, your bus has already left. You can't do that again. So you want to take advantage of this chance. When you're starting out, it's the time to start planting these seeds of, 
getting over some of the initial awkwardness, those first videos where you may not be comfortable, your first equipment may not be good. And that's okay, because the other thing, you're not going to have a bunch of eyeballs yet. And that's okay. Like That's better that when you're first figuring things out, not a lot of people are seeing it. And you can later, if you feel a little self-conscious, you can even take down some of the earlier stuff. I know my earliest video I've taken out, I've got plenty of this older stuff, but you know, at some point you can say, okay, well, it's not a representation of way I do stuff anymore. So you can get rid of that stuff if you choose to. But when you're early on, it's great because I still have to this day, people I work with who are great supporters, great people in our community, great people I've learned and met and got to know because I was open, learning, sharing videos, posting about stuff I was doing as I was doing it, figuring it out in my blog, in my early podcast and whatever. It helps. And maybe most importantly, it's going to help it come out better for a couple reasons. It's going to mean that you have people who are on the same wavelength that you could test it with to get feedback. And again, it's not just about saying, is this good or is this ready? It's about listening. It's about figuring out, okay, well, you're the kind of people who I really want to help. And perhaps getting to know them somehow through email exchanges, which several of my big business products, decisions, opportunities, services evolved out of emailing people who initially found me through my blogging, through my early YouTube videos. Through my things are just figuring out as I went. Having those conversations, learning from them and their needs and their challenges and realizing that the solutions I had were different than the solutions I was previously aiming for, but that I could do that because I was having those conversations. That's going to happen if you're in public about the learning and it can be, it's uncomfortable. It's like people talk about life is like learning the violin, how to play it in public. It's not going to sound very good. You feel self-conscious about it, but if you can overcome that, it's going to behoove you in the long run. You'll get, I'm much more camera comfortable than a lot of people in part because of those extra reps put in early. It also means that, again, you've got an audience who are going to be looking for perhaps championing that when you have a thing coming out, we'll be more than happy to retweet, to share the word, to post about it, to tell their friends at school, at the workplace, in their family, that this thing's coming out. They're looking forward to this. This person, they love their energy. They like what they're about. They seem like good people. They've been looking forward to this for a while. They've been rooting you on from the sidelines. And that's another reason why it can help your work come out better. Because part of what happens is people, they kind of out of their anxiety, their self-consciousness, their concerns, their fears will go kind of hide uh, in a corner doing their thing alone. And it's isolating. You start to kind of our mind plays tricks on us. Does it matter? Or making progress or whatever. When we have a community of people and it's clear that this is that when I release this, it's going to actually someone's looking forward to it. Someone wants this. It's exist for these people specifically. So much of my content I still develop, right? It's why my video course, completeeverproject.com is as good as it is because it was addressing a need of people in home team. And same thing for self-command and self-doubt. The audiobook's concluded at the end of it. When you have that audience that you know you're looking forward to, like, I want to help them, suddenly you're not alone anymore. Because even when you are technically sitting alone in your room, on your computer, doing the work that you're doing, what winds up happening is you're picturing that really this is part of a conversation. You've listened to them. You're preparing something to give back to them from which you have a sense of who you're going to be hearing back from afterwards about what they liked about it, disliked about it, what they might look forward to in future things. And it helps us finish because we're no longer alone in it. And it's so different than that skill or lens of craft or skill or making good decisions and judgments about what to do and how to do it, the, the, the details and all that, all that matters. But loneliness is just a different axis to navigate that can wear us down. And it's not even loneliness like, oh, I just need to go out to find and meet people locally or go to meetups and hangouts. It's because it's connected people who share your deep interest in this. The best way to do is to be sharing what you're doing. So anyway, I just want to encourage that. Learn in public. Let them come up with you. Share your learning as you go instead of saving until the very end and then trying to surprise them with a result that they can't look forward to, don't know is coming. I want to urge that. Thanks for following along. Hope this video is helpful to you. If you have other ideas you want to share about marketing, other questions you have, let me know in the comments below. Thanks, everybody, for following along, and I'll catch you next time.